Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape! Transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are trapped in a dark, empty house. A girl lying dead at your feet. And surrounding you, closing in on you, are a band of killers, deadly enemies of your country and yourself. And they are intent on murdering you. Today, with Barry Kroger starred as David, we escape to England and the story of a man whose life depended upon the outcome of his mission, as Graham Greene told it in his fascinating story... Confidential Agent. It was getting dark as the ship threaded its way through the tugs into Dover Harbor. The thick fog gave way reluctantly to the ship. It swirled over the deck. There was a cold bite to it, chilling me inside and out. Yet in a way, this cold English fog was more comforting than the atmosphere I had left. For in my country, there was war. Already Austria had fallen before the goose-stepping armies of a madman. And now my country was fighting with its back to the war. In order to continue to fight, we needed industrial diamonds to shape the tools of war. That's why I was now landing in England. There were others in my country, a group headed by a man known only as the Baron who wanted to turn our country over to the invader, who would do anything to stop us from getting the diamonds we needed. So you see, my mission was a secret one. Not even our own embassy knew of it. So far, the trip had been uneventful, except for meeting the girl. Her name was Rose Cullen. At first, she seemed too curious, asking questions about my trip, my visit, my friends. And I wondered if she were working with the Baron. But as time wore on, I decided I'd been mistaken. And I accepted her offer to drive me to London. Twenty minutes after we had docked, we were through the customs and walking towards the car park. Rose suddenly asked me to excuse her for a moment. Almost before I could answer her, she had vanished in the fog. Good evening, David. Baron, I have been expecting you. We have nothing to talk about, Baron. I think we could find a subject. Diamonds, for example... Or perhaps I could interest you in accepting, let us say, 2,000 pounds for our point of view, say 2,000 pounds. I still say we have nothing to talk about. <laughs> An honest man. It's a very dangerous hobby, David. Honesty? You may remember an old saying in our country. The honest man and the thief both pay the same price to death. Goodbye, David. He raised his hand in an open palm salute and walked away, the fog quickly swelling up to hide him. It was a shot, aimed at me. I jumped back against the wall. There was nothing to see but fog. Gray wisps of fog blanketing out everything. There was no way of telling from where death had tried to strike or from where it might strike again. I heard her returning. Had she left me to give them their chance... Or had it been her finger, manicured and perfumed, that had curled around the trigger? Sorry to be so long, David. Are you ready? Yes. I... I was talking to your friend, the Baron. The Baron? Oh, you must be mistaken. I don't know a Baron. Come along. Did he say he knew me? No. Perhaps I am mistaken. Of course, it might be someone I met at Father's. He loves to surround himself with titles. Oh, who is your father? Oh, here we are. Will you drive? I'm simply a divorce. Oh, all right. Oh. My father? Oh, he's Lord Bendage. Didn't you know? Lord Bendage? But I thought your your name is Colin. Of course. My father's name was Edward Colin. After his first million pounds, he became Edward, Lord Bendage. It's really quite simple. I came here to do business with Lord Bendage. Isn't that a coincidence? Everybody I meet has business with him. I see. I can't think of anything more dull than father's business. 
What are you thinking? How, in my country, I would go along a country road like this very slowly. Ready to jump into a ditch if I heard the plane. I'm not sure the war has not followed me here. Oh, don't be silly. The only war here is between the Prime Minister who talks about peace in our time and Mr. Churchill, who talks just as long about the glory that was Britain. And nobody believes in anything. You're very cynical for such a pretty girl. What is there for me to believe in? My father's done. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly something to get passionate about. You have uh, no young man? Oh, plenty. If I want to know who scored 60 runs in the Lansing Brighton cricket match, <laughs> or the odds at Epsom Dance. But there, there's no excitement. If it's excitement you want, perhaps we still will get it. One of my countrymen tried to kill me just before you joined me. Oh, really? It's true. He or his men will certainly try again before I reach your father. Oh, don't be so melodramatic. Things like that don't happen except in thrillers. Unless, of course, you're a spy. <laughs> Are you? No. No. <laughs> no, I'm more of a confidential agent. I, uh, be... What's the matter? What's that ahead of us? Oh, it's just a lorry. Why is he blocking the road? He's stalled, probably. I'm sorry you are mixed up in this oh, road. He's only someone out of Hold on, we're going on the... in the window sheet. Someone is trying to kill you. Yes. Oh, we must go to the police. With what? We saw no one we could identify. Oh, but we struck one of them. I felt the car hit him. Couldn't they be traced by him? All it would prove is that I ran him down. In fact, they might use that to have me arrested. Oh, no. But the Baron fails to kill me, and I think I can see to that. Then it would serve him almost as much to have me arrested for murder. <laughs> Late at night when we reached London. Rose wanted to drive me to my destination, but I refused. It wasn't entirely distrust, but a fear that she might lead them to me without realizing it. So she dropped me off in the West End. When she'd driven on, I stopped the taxi, gave the driver the address. He brought me to an old two-story house, its dirty gray front bearing witness to the poverty of the neighborhood. Here you are, Governor. This is number 10, Mallon End. That's right, Governor. Just over there. You up across the road and you'll be at the door. How can you be so sure, driver? It's so foggy here, I can't see the number. Ah, I counted them. Counted the houses from the corner of High Street. I see. That's number 10, all right. All right. That will be three and six, Mr. Oh, yes, of course. Here, here you are. Oh, oh, thanks very much, Governor. Thank you. Good night. Good night. I stepped closer and peered through the fog that blanketed the buildings. Only here and there a feeble gleam of light struggling through. I stood there for a moment looking at it. There was no light visible in any of the windows. And I wondered, fear pressing in with the fog, if something had happened to our agent. I kept my hand near my gun as I pressed the button beside the door. If something had happened to our agent... This might be a trap. The door opened a few inches, and a pinched, elfin face, neither old nor young, looked out at me. What do you want this time of night? I'm sorry, but I'm David. David? D, as in diamonds. Oh, come in. Just a minute, I'll turn on the lights. You... You're much younger than I thought you'd be. We are using them younger these days. Uh, I was just making a spot of tea. Perhaps you'd like some. Oh, yes, I would. Very much. Uh, you. you see, I, I've been very careful with lights since I saw someone watching the house two days ago. One of the Baron's men, you think? I don't know. I just thought it better not to take chances. Oh, good girl. Good girl. The Baron came over on the same boat with me. Oh? Did he see you? Oh, yes. Thank you. All right. We even had a short talk at the customs. You... What did he say? You offered me money for a vacation. How much? Two thousand pounds. You refused? Of course. Two thousand pounds. 
Well, this day is good. After being out in the fog, it's mm. warm. That's more money than I've ever seen in my life. How do I know you refused? I suppose that's a question I would ask, too. Were I in your place? <laughs> you know, I wonder if that isn't the Baron's biggest crime against us. That he's made us eternally suspicious of each other. Yes, I... What is your name? Elsie. Elsie. Well, Elsie, you don't know that I did take the 2,000 pounds. But I'm going to see Lord Bendich tomorrow, and maybe that will prove it. And then you'll be going back? Uh, Monday, yes. Oh, I see. Now, what do you have for me? Oh, not very much. You see, I know that the Baron has friends everywhere, even in the English government. But Lord Bendich will deal with you first if you are there on time and can prove you represent your government. If I did not show up, then he'd be free to deal with the Baron. Yes, that's it exactly. Now, look, if you're seeing Bendich and his syndicate tomorrow, yes. then I must warn you again that... The shot came through the window. I leaped to the wall, turned off the light. I knelt, found her wrist. There was no pulse. And she was dead. Kneeling there, I cursed myself. The minute she told me that someone had been watching the house, I should have known that both of us had to get out. I should have known there was no time for tea and talk. Suddenly, there was a sound. The door. The killer or killers were in the house. To stay there in that dark, small room, try to shoot it out with them, could have only one ending. They were blocking off the front door. If I couldn't leave through a window, I'd be a perfect target that way. I began to edge toward the other door in the back. It was slow work. Then, I was in what seemed to be a kitchen. A gloomy patch of light guided me to the door. I pressed my face to the glass, strained to see outside. A man was standing, only a few feet from the back door. There's only one other way to go. Up. I slipped out of the kitchen into the hall. After what seemed hours... I found the stairway and carefully stepped on the first step. It creaked. I leaped higher and up to one side just in time. Another step. Start again. There was only one thing to do. I raced up the stairs. I flung myself to the floor. Downstairs, I heard the front door open again. More of them had entered the house. They were taking no chances. I lay there on the floor at the head of the stairs, scarcely daring to breathe. I knew I could get anyone coming up that stairs with my gun, but was there another stairway to the second floor? I knew so many of these houses had them. Perhaps this one did too. And that... Somewhere outside, I heard something thump against the side of the house. One of them was trying to get in. One of them was coming in through some window on the second floor. From every side, death was closing in on me. just a moment, we will return to Escape. But first, that happy but hectic couple, Ozzie and Harriet, come home to CBS tomorrow at 6.30 Eastern Standard Time. So get your whole family together to welcome them home next Sunday night when they'll be heard on most of these same CBS stations just before the Jack Benny Show. And now with our star, Barry Kroger as David, we return to the second act of Escape and Confidential Agent. <laughs> second floor of the old house on Mallon End, and the Baron's men were downstairs, slowly working their way up to me, searching me out. It was a quick decision. The open rooftop presented a chance of escape, and lying here in the dark was tempting discovery. A moment later, I was through a skylight and in the night air. Five houses away, I found fire escape and has reached the ground. And two blocks farther on Blean Street, I found a cheap hotel and registered under another name. The next morning, I took a taxi to the house of Lord Bendich. The butler, with the empty face of the typical British servant, took my coat and then showed me into the room where Lord Bendich and four other men waited. These men were the Diamond Syndicate. You're the man we're expecting? Yes. I think you know the object of my visit. 
We had a letter a fortnight ago. Strange the purchase wasn't handled through your embassy or consulate. Mm. Uh, this is Mr. Forbes. How do you do? How do you do? Lord Petty. Oh, my lord. Mr. Briggstock. How do you do, sir? Mr. O'Grady. You'll forgive us if we get to business right away? I should like that. Now, I'm, I'm prepared to pay the highest market price for which I have here a side draft and a bonus of 25% after the diamonds reach my country. Mm, you will take the diamonds yourself? Oh, yes. Then the bonus should be paid now. Bendit is right, old boy. You might never go back. Then where should we be? Perhaps, Lord Bendit, we could accept the offer as it is if we are given notes covering the bonus. Oh, yes. I'm quite prepared to do that. Very well. <clears throat> you understand we could do better than this, but we'd like to do business with established government. Uh, we must, however, be certain that you have the right to speak for your government. Uh, you have your credentials, of course. Certainly, I have them. Uh, something wrong? It's, it's extraordinary. I, I had them in my breast pocket with my passport here. Perhaps you left I... them at your hotel. Morning after a tacky evening, or I... I had them right here when I entered this house. Is you implying... I did have my papers. They've been stolen. I dare say. Well... It's obvious we can't do business with an unaccredited agent. Lord, then it's, it's a stolen. rough go, old boy. But it looks like uh, you've had it. We are sorry. But Lord Benditch is right. We can't I walked slowly it. out of the room. I must admit they were fair. The butler must have taken the papers when they helped me off with my coat. But I had no proof. I went out into the hall, took my coat from the rack. I was about to leave when I heard my name. David! It was Rose Cullen. David, did you get the diamonds from Father? No, my papers have been stolen, and your Rose. father won't deal with me since I could not prove I represent my government. Rose, do you know, is your father's butler new? Well, I, I think so, although I didn't really notice. I don't live here. I have my own apartment. You mean you think he... I'm sure of it. I had my papers when I came up the steps. They were gone when I went to show them to your father. Then that means... Come along, David. We'll find out. No, Rose. That would do no good. I'm sure that the Baron will have covered all loopholes. The papers are far away by now. No. I must think of some other way to convince your father. Well, isn't there someone at your embassy? Hmm. I don't think so. We don't trust them. Except perhaps the second secretary. He... But even he may have been reached. But we've got to do something. We can't we? just... Uh... Why do you suddenly want to help me? Only last night you were laughing at me, Rose. Maybe I was. Last night. Well, then, why... Oh, David, can't you guess why I want to help you? To be with you. Rose, look. Oh, all you think of is your stupid war. Last night I laughed at you because you were a stuffy little man from another country, filled with ideas of his own importance and briefs and papers... Now, after I've had a chance to think things over, I know this isn't true. Rose, a man in my position has to give up many things. He has no time to... Fall in love. <sighs> Why not, David? Why not? Rose. Oh, all right. I won't embarrass you. Now, tell me something. Forbes and Brigstock were with Father when you met? Yes, yes, they were. All right, then. Brigstock is an ass, but they'll both help your country if they're sure it's all right. I'll get them, and the four of us will go to your embassy. We'll make them prove who you are. She was right. They both did seem anxious to help, and were quite willing to go to the embassy with us. At the embassy, we waited for the second secretary. Then a man appeared. A countryman of mine, although I had never seen him before. May I help you, gentlemen? Yes. Mm. Uh, my name is Forbes. Uh, this is Mr. Brigstock. How do you know? We are associated with Lord Bendich. This is his daughter. We are considering doing business with this other gentleman who claims to represent your government. I know of no official representative being sent to you. What is your name, sir? Here is my passport. This is very strange. Mr. Forbes. The man whose name is on this passport is no longer alive. Are you sure? He was shot by the rebels. Oh, well, you're I... lying. 
You didn't even look at the passport. You had your story ready before we even got here. As a matter of fact, yes. We were warned that someone was posing as this man. We've had the Scotland Yard man here hoping he'd show up. Inspector! Scotland Yard, eh? They'll get to the bottom of this. I have no doubt. Ah, uh, is this the man? Yes. And here is his passport, Inspector. I see. Well, sir, we're going to have to hold you. On what charges, Inspector? Well, there are several, Miss. Using a, far, a forged passport, illegal entry into the country, trying to obtain a contract under false pretenses, inquiry into a hit-and-run death on the Dover Road last night, and inquiry into the death of a young woman on Mallon End. What if I refuse to accompany you, Inspector? Well, in that case, sir, I'm afraid I'll have to force you. If you need it, Inspector, I have a gun here. He doesn't need it, but I... Oh, no! no stand back! Don't try to find me through the door! Wait, David! I'm coming with you! <laughs> The two of us backed out of the room and ran downstairs. I knew it would be only a matter of minutes before there'd be an alarm out and Scotland Yard would be looking for me as well as the Baron's men. I was sure that I could beat the murder charges. But by that time, it would be too late to get the industrial diamonds to my country, even if I could buy them. Rose took me to her apartment. Then, without telling me what she was going to do, she left. An hour later, she was back. David! It worked. What worked? I went to find Forbes and Brigstock. I convinced them that you don't dare stay and face the charges, and they're going to sell you the diamonds you need in spite of Father. Isn't it wonderful? You are. I don't know how I can ever repay you. By taking me back with you. Rose, darling, I told you before. I'm not asking you to marry me. I'm only asking you to go back with you, to take part in something that's decent and honest. After that, well, we'll take what comes. You don't know what you're asking, Rose. It is not so simple as a job going back. What do you mean? After today, Scotland Yard will be watching every ship leaving England. I can't book passage. I'll have to find some way to slip out of the country. Oh, Forbes can arrange that, too. After you get the diamonds. Forbes and Brigstock brought the diamonds. A small package that meant life for at least a while longer to my country. They both seemed only embarrassed when I tried to thank them, and when they left, Rose went with them. They had not been gone long. There was a knock on the door. I, uh, I hesitated to answer to it. It's Brickstock, old boy. I say, let me in. Well, Mr. Brickstock, is something wrong? Oh, not a thing, old boy. You know, it occurred to me that you're in a bit of a spot about getting out of the country. Now that you have the diamonds, an idea happily struck me, so I just nipped back. You know how I can get away? Quite. The perfect solution, old boy, is this. A gun? A but... of you to recognize it. No, no, no. I assure you I'm an expert shot. Bullseye and all that sort of thing. You're one of them. In a manner of speaking, yes. You see, I'm one of the fortunate few who recognize that democracies are decadent. Too weak, you know. Nothing for me to do but work with other Johnnies who agree. An Aryan world for all you Aryan supermen. Is that it? You know, Rose has exquisite taste in rugs. It's a pity you'll have to bleed all over. You're quite insane, Briggs, no. Not at all. You see, people like you never have the brains to understand the glorious world that we are going to build. A world dedicated to joy from strength. <laughs> can never resist making speeches. I thought there was something suspicious about Big Stock leaving us so suddenly, so I followed him. Ah, but there's no time to talk. You have to get out of here quickly. Where shall I go? I own a resort hotel near South Crawl. I'll make a reservation for you, and tonight one of my men will pick you up there, put you on a freighter bound for your country. And Big Stock? Big Stock is our problem. I'll give them a full report of it when I turn myself in, as I must do. Perhaps Perhaps my trial will help my country as much as your escape will help yours. I reached the hotel just as it was getting dark. The lobby was filled with men and women in shorts and jackets, all of them talking of sports. Surely no place was safer. I went over to buy a newspaper. I say, 
Don't I know you? Your face is familiar. I don't believe so. Uh, foreigner, aren't you? Why, have it. Saw a photograph of you in the stock press edition of the Express. I'm afraid you've made a mistake. Can't get away from Scotland Yard. Best police force in the world. No, I remember. It was murder. Don't try to get away now. I shall take measures, you know. I thought of making a run for it, but there was no use. The lobby was filled with people. I couldn't hold up all of them. My captor sent someone to call the police. We sat down and waited. You foreigners aren't civilized, you know. Hello told me when he was in Prague, he saw a chap shoot down a bobby right on the street. Can't do that sort of thing, you know. Anyone in here by the name here of... Here we are. Are you the detective? Uh, the detective? Uh, why, yes. Then here's your man. Oh, I see. Uh, I have a warrant for your arrest. Uh, charging I you. know the charge, officer. Don't bother with it. Well, then, uh, uh, come along, then. No handcuffs? Oh, I don't think that will be necessary. I have a car right out here. Well, that was a close one. Close one? Yes. It's a good thing you played along or I wouldn't have been sure what the charges were. You mean you're not a detective? Heavens, no. <laughs> Mr. Forbes didn't tell me the yard was in this. Oh, they weren't before. It was in the last edition of the paper. One man recognized me and called the police. Yeah, lucky I came when I did that, Betty. Well, we'll be at the coast before they get a search underway. We reached the coast in half an hour, and I was hoisted over the side of a small freighter, like a piece of cargo. I stayed below until we were well underway, and then went above. The deck was uncovered, and the wind whipped the sharp spray across my face. I could feel the pressure of the package of diamonds in my pocket. My mission was over, and I was on my way home. Yet I felt neither relief nor happiness. I'd thought there was no room in my life for both war and love. But now that there was only war ahead, I felt empty. I stared off at the lights, glimmering somewhere far astern. That... that would be Plymouth Hope. Rose. Oh, David. Rose, now. <laughs> Oh, this is not the time for tears. When, when I was a little girl, someone told me that most men don't know what they want, so they make gestures. Oh, and Ford said the same thing this afternoon. And so I, I decided not to waste time. And I made the decision for both of us. Between Mr. Forbes and yourself, my darling, it seems everything has been taken care of. Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today we have presented transcribed Confidential Agent by Graham Greene, adapted for radio by Ken Crossan, with editorial supervision by John Dunkel. Starred as David was Barry Kroger. Featured in the cast were Edgar Barrier, Constance Cavendish, Herb Butterfield, Parley Bear, Olive Deering, Ben Wright, Wilms Herbert, and Alec Harford. Special music was arranged and played by Ivan Detmar. Next week... You are standing alone in a lonely canyon in the shadows of Superstition Mountain. While facing you, Pimper's ragged guns drawn are three men who at your first move toward hidden treasure will shoot you dead. Next week, we escape with Ralph Bates' unusual story, When the Man Comes, Follow Him. Be sure to tune in at the same time next week when once again we offer you Escape. Tomorrow night on CBS is really something to talk about and listen to. Academy Award winner Jane Wyman on the CBS Family Hour of Stars. Ozzie and Harriet, Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, Sam Spade, and Lum and Abner. These are only a few of the great stars and shows which will come to you tomorrow night on most of these same CBS network stations. Jack Benny, of course, will be heard on the entire CBS network. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for five minutes of the latest news to be followed by the Let's Pretend program over most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS.
as the Columbia Broadcasting System.